then Jesus and the disciples went on from there and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know it. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. They did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him. I'm going to pause here just for a minute. It's interesting, Jesus didn't want anyone else to know where they were going. Why is that? Why is that? Maybe because there are things here that Jesus only wants his inner circle to hear. Because it takes a little bit of investment. It takes a little bit of time. It takes paying attention if they're really going to get what he says. And surely these words about how the Son of Man is going to die and be raised, that's something that's going to take the rest of their lives to understand, not just, not just this journey through reality. You know, today, there's a high percentage of people who say that they are spiritual, but not religious. Spiritual, but not religious, which means they're concerned about the things of the soul, things of the spirit, but they don't want to be bound to any tradition. That's what, you know, religious means. It comes to the same root word as ligament, when you're bound, when you're connected. They don't want to be connected to any particular religious tradition. But they want to be spiritual. And on the one hand, I applaud that desire to be spiritual, to, the desire to, to take control of your own faith. You know, one of the Presbyterian principles is that, is that God alone is the Lord of the conscience, which means it's both my privilege and my responsibility to decide what I believe, to make the faith my own, not just to take whatever whatever I'm given and blindly accept it, but to really think about it, to really deliberate about it, and to make the faith my own. So there's something good about that impulse, to be spiritual and religious, but there's something about it uh, that I cringe at as well. I mean, think about it. There have been 2,000 years, more, of biblical tradition, people reflecting on the same questions that we ask. Who am I? Why am I here? Why do good people suffer? Do I really want to just sort of push that aside and figure out, I'll, I'll figure this out on my own? I'll come up with my own answer to those questions? I mean, if a physicist or a mathematician did that, you know, say, we'll start from scratch. We won't worry about what everybody's learned so far. We'll start from scratch. They would never do that. So to really genuinely seek God, I think you need to start with a religious tradition, to live in it, to learn it, and to challenge it, and to question it, and to make it your own, or then to seek, to seek wisdom beyond. But don't give up what's been handed on to you. Don't give up. Give up what has been, what has been experienced over all these generations. Because those things really do benefit us. So I think spiritual, but spiritual and religious, which actually also has a relatively high percentage. You never really hear about that. That never gets advertised. But a large percentage of people are spiritual and religious. And that, that's a very healthy combination. Anyway, we'll keep reading here. So then Jesus and the disciples came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. For on the way they had argued with one another, who was the greatest? Jesus sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all, and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them. Taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. The Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. So the disciples want to be great, or maybe in today's words we would say to be successful. And why not? 
Why not seek to be great? Why not seek to be successful? Why not try to win? I remember 16 years ago when I took up the game of soccer. I hadn't played a competitive sport in years. I'd spent my whole life at the church where we cooperate, where we work together. And it was so refreshing to do something where I really wanted to win. <laughs> That's not a bad thing, is it? I mean, in this world, winning matters, whether it's your sales figures or what you get on the ACT. And I have to say, even though I played in, played in soccer leagues where you don't, you don't even keep score. There's no scoreboard. You don't keep standings. But it was always a lot more fun when you won. So I don't mind winning, trying to win, trying to be great, being a success. That's all good. That's all good. But Jesus redefines greatness. Jesus redefines winning. Jesus redefines success. Most of you probably saw the movie Amadeus years ago about Mozart. But it's really not so much about Mozart as it is about Salieri, who is the court composer to the king in Vienna, Austria. And if you see, if you ever have the chance to see the play Amadeus, I encourage you to see it because uh, the dialogue in the play is, is different than in the movie. And this, this part of the story comes out so much more clearly in the play. But Salieri's goal, his lifelong ambition, and he makes a deal with God to be, is to be the most famous composer in all of Austria, in all of Europe. And Salieri achieves his goal, his ambition. He becomes the most famous composer. But then along comes this upstart, this young, sometimes funny, sometimes rather disgusting character named Mozart. He plays the most sublime. He writes the most wonderful, beautiful music. And Salieri knows that while he's been given, he's achieved his goal. He's done all that he wanted to do. He is the most famous composer, and yet he hears the music of Mozart and knows that that music will live on for centuries, and he will be forgotten. Hal Vick told me that Thomas Merton, a monk, said this, people spend all their lives climbing the ladder of success, only to get to the top and realize that the ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. I remember Paul Sangas, the senator from Massachusetts, who was a cancer survivor. And uh, he quit the Senate. He quit the Senate. And he said, you know, nobody on their deathbed ever said they wish they'd given more time to their business. Jesus says that true greatness, true success, if you really want it, then you must be the servant of all. It's a whole different definition of what matters most. Reminds me of Harry Chapin, the uh, Cats in the Cradle composer, singer, who uh, was a great humanitarian. He founded a World Hunger Year. People would say to him, what year is World Hunger Year? And he would say, every year is World Hunger Year until there's no more hunger. Anyway, Harry Chapin said, I do one concert for me and one for the other guy. Well, one concert for me, one for the other guy, one for charity. He knew something about what Jesus meant, about true greatness, what it really means to be a success. Stephen Covey, you know, the seven habits of highly effective people, one of them is write a mission statement. Just that, write a mission statement. Just the idea that you should write a statement that's a mission statement that says you have a mission to make a difference, to matter in somebody else's life. It's a church word, mission. It's a faith word, mission. It's a spiritual and religious word, mission. And Stephen Covey, who's trying to tell you how to be a success, says you need a mission. If you want to be first, you must be last and a servant of all. What? You know, Jesus shows what this means by taking a child into his arms, 
You know, a child, the most vulnerable, the most powerless then, and still in many ways, the same in today's, in our world today. And true greatness, true success, comes in how you treat children. How you treat those without. Somebody told me once the mark of a person's character is how they treat the waiter or the waitress. What difference would it make in our great debates and discussions about what we should do as a nation, who we should be, about immigration, about health care, about food stamps, about practically anything, if we always made sure there was a child in the room? Not to say anything, just, just to be a silent witness to how will what we're doing affect children. I think our discussions would be a little different. So what's your definition of success? What's your definition of greatness? Think about what you're doing in your world to make a difference in the life of a child. In the life of a child of God. In the life of a child of God of any age. You could be coaching soccer, leading a brownie troop. You could be reading with one of those kids at Alvin Dunn. You could be keeping special tabs on your elderly neighbor because you know their family all lives miles and miles and miles away. You could be working for Jubilee, trying to relieve the third world of debt. You could be praying for our soldiers. You could be praying for kids in Afghanistan. There are thousands of things you can do to be a servant. There are thousands of things you can do to redefine what it means to be a success, to redefine what it means to be great. I mean, think about it. You know who won the Super Bowl last year, right? Who won it the year before? Who won it the year before that? True greatness has to do with something else entirely. Uh, some people say, well, what's my purpose? They want one purpose. What, do I, what can I do? And there are people that have a cause. They have one thing that they're doing in their life that's going to make a difference, that's going to change the world. Some people have that, but I think most of us do not. For most of us, the words of Mother Teresa bring true. Mother Teresa said, there are no great things. There are only little things done with great love. If you spend your life doing little things with great love, when the string of your days comes to an end, you won't be second-guessing yourself. You won't be wishing you've done something else. Because you will have found greatness you will have found what it really means to be a success. Pray with me. Gracious God, open our eyes. Open our eyes to what really matters most. And whatever that is for each of us, let us do what matters most with great love. Christ's sake, yes, for the world's sake, surely. And also for our own sakes, we ask it. Amen.